Tonight it is all about the law, the Charleston church shooting suspect facing nine counts of murder, and the FBI is investigating it as a hate crime. We'll ask our panel of attorneys why that designation matters in a court of law. Then as early as tomorrow, the Supreme Court could rule on huge cases involving Obamacare and gay marriage. We'll discuss the implications and ramifications of this with a lawyer who's argued before the high court. Then that speed trap that you got caught going too fast could be illegal. We'll ask our attorneys whether those speed cameras are flat out unconstitutional. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in tonight for Richard French and we start tonight in Charleston and the aftermath of that tragic church shooting. The suspect, Dylan Roof, is in jail tonight facing nine counts of murder. Now there's no question what happened was hateful. There's also no question the shooter targeted black victims in a black church. And that is why the FBI is investigating this as a hate crime. But what are the implications of prosecuting something as a hate crime? For that and more, we turn to our legal panel. Jim Kosoris is a criminal defense attorney in Manhattan who sits on the board of directors of the New York City Criminal Bar Association. He frequently lectures at New York Law School and the bar associations in Queens and New York City. Welcome. Mayo Bartlett is an attorney at the law offices of Mayo Bartlett PLLC and former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County District Attorney's Office. And Mark Furnish is a professor at Brooklyn Law and has argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. So there's no state statute in South Carolina about hate crimes. My question, on there, it's usually done as an enhancement on other crimes to make the penalty stiffer. In this case, the suspect is facing either the death penalty or life in prison. Is there a need for an enhancement in this case? And, and if not, why investigate this as a hate crime, Jim? Well, what Loretta Lynch has said is that because there is no hate crime in Charleston, that hate component is not being addressed. So quite frankly, you're absolutely right as it will not serve as an enhancement to the penalty of federal prosecution would be mostly symbolic to prosecute that component of the incident. So Mayo, what's the value for, from a larger standpoint of, of prosecuting this as a hate crime? Is there, is there some other thing that kicks in? Is there a federal process to this? Well, there's, there's also the possibility that you're doing it so that it's actually designated properly because you keep uh, hate crime statistics and hate, hate crime statistics are voluntarily given by de different states. So if you look, uh, there are certain states, for instance, Alabama for a while would have no hate crimes reported and you'd have other places where you'd have a lot of hate crimes reported. It wasn't necessarily indicative of what was happening in that jurisdiction, but it does help you to track what's going on. It adds to the statistics in terms of uh, where your resources need to go as well. So, so it's just the, it's the statistical advantage. Does this, Mark, does this take this from a state case to a federal case? Would that? Well, there's going to be a separate federal case, and I agree with with Jimmy that it's largely symbolic. But I think in this instance, it's an important symbol because you have to understand it's not just a sentence enhancer. It's a very controversial federal statute that was passed, and it was passed under the authority of the Thirteenth Amendment. So this is right in the wheelhouse of what the statute was intended to address. The 13th Amendment deals with the emancipation of slaves, and it seeks to eradicate the badges and incidents of slavery. And the way this statute has been applied federally, it's in fact very rarely been applied to crimes, racially motivated crimes against black people, the very people it was principally intended to benefit. So this is purely symbolic. If he's going to get death or life in South Carolina, it will have no practical effect, but it vindicates as Jimmy said, an unaddressed federal interest. And that interest is saying that we will not tolerate remnants, badges, and incidents of slavery in this country. And federally. Let, let me stay with tolerate. you on this because is there a danger in, in hate crime prosecutions? Because you are asking a judge or a jury to essentially read the Thought mind crime. and motive. Thought crime, yes. There's, there's a lot of dangers, and I'm not a proponent or a fan of this statute at all. But in this instance, this is the very target of the statute. We can uh, argue about whether hate crime statutes are, are wise policy or bad policy, and Mayo you know, has extensive experience with this at the state level. The fact is it's on the books. It's been upheld under the 13th Amendment. This is what the statute was designed to address, not necessarily the Matthew Shepherds of the world, although that's how it's been applied. If you're going to apply it, this is the case to apply it. Although, Andrew, I will say that when you look at these cases, it's much more, it, it should not be a thought crime, and it shouldn't simply be because people are of different racial backgrounds or whatever the background may be. Uh, you look really toward more than simply whether racial slurs are used, whether the people are of different backgrounds. You look to see what was the actual motive what was the action? 
did uh, hatred actually play a significant role in why the person did what they did? Now, this young man has statements that are attributed to him that seem to suggest at this point that he's targeted them based upon them being a black church. His objective was to create a race war. So it fits all of the criteria. If you were missing some of those criteria, then it would be a little more difficult for you to say that it should definitely be a hate crime. And look, nobody's going to shed any tears over this guy. And it seems fairly cut and dry that this was motivated by hate. But there have been plenty of other cases, including the Tyler Clementi uh, case, which was the suicide uh, the student from Rutgers, where they then tried to get into the mind of his roommate to find out if hatred motivated or prompted him to uh, lead to the actions that led to the suicide. What, what's your thought, Jimmy? Are there concerns that you have about trying to figure out the motives of somebody? Well, the, I, I think that the, the difference in the two cases is trying to delve into one person's mind in order to discern what another person's motives are are one thing. Here, this individual posted his own motives in very uncertain terms and, and corroborated what we already knew. So there's always a concern that I have about extrapolating what somebody's motives might be from other people. But in this case, as, as everybody has said, it's as cut and dry as it gets. Well, I mean, think about Zimmerman. There was a hue and cry about taking the case federal. And his motive was really rather inscrutable in the case. Uh, like it or not, it was inscrutable. There were viable claims of self-defense there. And the feds are very circumspect about wading into that type of situation. Not so here. And rightly, this is going to be a powerful symbolic message. Now, there's another legal issue that has stemmed from this case in South Carolina. Pastor Clementa Pickney's body was moved for, to the state capitol where it's lying in state today. His funeral is Friday, and President Obama will speak. City council members had heard that members of the Westboro Baptist Church were planning to come to town to demonstrate, and that caused them to issue a ban on protests near the funerals. Demonstrators will have to be at least 300 feet away. And Mark, there was a Supreme Court case about this very church protesting soldiers' funerals. Didn't the Supreme Court say that protesters have a right to picket funerals? Well, they have a First Amendment right, but the First Amendment right is not absolute. And, you know, there's such a thing in the First Amendment law as reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And that question was not reached in the Supreme Court case because there was no legislation on the books at that time. In that state, it was a sheer First Amendment problem. Here, they're not saying you can't speak. They're restricting the manner in which you can speak, to wit, the 300-foot restriction and more problematically, and again, I stress this wasn't addressed in the last case, they were also saying that they can't speak at all for an hour before or an hour afterward. That's going to be problematic. And to me, it's not really a content neutral restriction, and we talked about this off camera. This is, has a 60-day sunset, so it's clear <laughs> that the aim here is to suppress speech for the next two weeks. It sounds like you're saying if they wanted to, to file suit on that or seek an injunction uh, about that ordinance, that you think they have a case. They have a case. Whether they would prevail or not, I'm not sure, but they certainly have a, a colorable claim. And whether they'd get it in time. Right. Well, I mean, they got to get it in the now, and they, they have, have to show sue, they can right. try to get an injunction, but it'll all be over. Well, by we then. don't you even think they know, have a case? Though. I think they do have a viable claim, but uh, again, by the time they actually file their papers and get in front of a judge, It'll be moved. Well, Mail? they could get in there real quick, but we don't know what we don't know for a fact that it's Westboro, and we don't know what they're going to say. And what they're going to say depends on whether it's First Amendment protected. You think they have a case? I think that they have a quick a case, certainly because it expires when it does. It seems to fit right around the time frame uh, that, that's involving this particular funeral, and it will not apply to other people's funerals. So, for example, if you have a soldier who dies, they can be there uh, the day after this expires. Right. They don't need it. The president is speaking for security concerns. They can probably keep every, keep that's everybody three feet away. But that's Friday. Away. I mean, there might right. be other people. Right, but it's going to go on for a couple weeks. Right. All right. Uh, there's a, another story related to a mass murder we wanted to update you on. Convicted Boston Marathon bomber Zokar Sarnayev apologized for what he did during his sentencing hearing today. It's the first time Sarnayev has spoken in court. Last month, the jury decided to give him the death sentence. Today's hearing was something of a formality in front of a federal judge, and that death sentence was, in fact, imposed. We'll be right back.